afternoon, everyone. It's time to start this fourth last session of the Academy Camp number five of the Capacity Building for European Capitals of Culture project, which will delve on the issue of the potential of the digital. Of course, under the leadership of Jordi Pascual, who has been leading these wonderful conversations since yesterday morning. This afternoon, it's Nicole McNally's turn, who was the lead trainer for our Academy Camp with Chemnitz on this issue that I just mentioned, the potential of the digital for the European Capitals of Culture, but also for cultural projects initiatives at large. So... Without further ado, Jordi, thank you so much. The floor is yours. And thank you, Nicole, for being with us. Thank you very much, Mercedes. Muchísimas gracias. A pleasure to lead this, this conversation with Nicole, a researcher, evaluator, and facilitator, originally from Northern Ireland, currently based in the Netherlands. But today, she is in, in Ireland. Nicole works across culture with specialisms in digital cultural heritage, music, and international cultural relations. She's worked for and with organizations, including Arts Council England, PRS for Music Foundation, uh, DG, DG INPA, DG EAC, the British Council, Voices of Culture, the partnership that brings the voice of the civil society to the mechanisms of the European Commission, also UNESCO. She's currently impact advisor at Europeana Foundation, where she leads the development of the impact playbook. And she also is a collaborator in Culture Solutions, a social innovation group dedicated to promoting innov innovation in the International Union International Cultural Relations. With this background, I, can, I cannot imagine a better curricula. We will uh, discuss on the digital strategies for European capital of culture. We will probably go beyond this because what Nicole is going to explain, it is based on her work with cultural institutions and organizations, events. And the topic is so new so challenging, so full of doubts for the non-digital uh, natives like uh, myself. It's so important for us as human beings, for our communities, that we all have many questions. And, and uh, yeah, we will try to, to go through all these questions. Nicole, the first question is, is, is uh, related to, to the to the Academy Camp, Academy Camp 2, that you held in, in Chemnitz. Uh, but it is very much related to the ECOC, to, to the many ECOCs that we have here with us uh, today. What does a digital strategy for uh, an ECOC mean? What, what is a digital strategy about? Thank you. For having me here um, it's really a pleasure to see um, some faces and names and uh, people that I've um, that we've worked with in the academy camp um, super happy to be here so um, the main theme which came out of our academy camp and actually which informed the development of the program which we had was really that digital was not just one thing and when we talk about a digital strategy it sounds as if you have, you know, like one document and you have different sections of each part of your work, but actually it should sort of be the other way around when every plan you have for all of your work should incorporate digital. So it's sort of throwing the idea of digital on the other side of it, on the other side of the, or the other way, it's a different question really. And I was thinking also, for example, within, uh, to take it to another, uh, to a non echo um, example, Within Europeana, we are constantly saying, you know, we need digitization strategies. That's very specific to the digitization of cultural heritage and, for example, the funding that comes along with that. But it's not a digital, you know, one digital strategy um, as one separate thing uh, covering only, you know, certain different topics. So I think for an ECOC, um, I think there are 
I was thinking about what the approach could be for a, a strategy and you also posed a question previously about the main things which could be in a digital strategy for ECROX and um, I think there are four things which I which I was thinking about so there are people and place and these are you know the, the real things which you know drive uh, ECROX the, the communities around you and the place in which you are based and the connections also to other places around you and internationally and then you have the process and actually the process I think is actually where the, dig the digital strategy comes in a bit more strongly and then you have the product and basically there are sort of four key uh, areas I say which you would consider in a digital strategy the people place the process and the product and in each of these, you see many different things. I was trying to think about actually how you prioritize these, but I think it's very dependent on your situation and your level of, you know, how you might rate your digital maturity with different things. Um, and that might then uh, help you identify your prioritization, which things um, are most important to work on. And there are also three different um, sort of transversal themes to run through these, which are mindset, values and the vision. And I was really inspired working with Sam Lindley on the Academy Camp and her focus on having a theory of change, this really impact driven approach to um, programming. Um, and as an impact advisor and working a lot on impact assessments and evaluation, I, I really loved how embedded this thinking was in something so creative as well. It was very data led, very, um, very uh, driven. Um, and this vision, I think, is super important, but also the values, this, you know, this focus on authenticity, um, focus on inclusion and being inclusive, also being critical and asking tough questions and being led by the grassroots, by the bottom up. And then this mindset. Um, and I think this mindset is also something which comes in quite um, in Europeana, when we work with, um, we defined, I led an exercise to define what digital transformation means for um, heritage organizations. And we define this in two ways. It's not just about the tools you're using, the services you're, you're creating, but it's also the mindset you take towards digital. And I think, you know, the, the, the you know, the, what I have here, proactive, welcoming, open, reflective might change in different con contexts. You might have different things in there. But having a mindset that's open towards digital is pretty important. So having a proactive mindset, I think, is very important. Um, and also reflective, because I think um, also within this digital strategy is room for failure. And I have this in terms of the process. You know, you have here failure and um, conflict and probably conflict management should also be in here. But also the idea of review points, evaluation, iterative improvement. So I think I may have opened up the question completely widely in terms of what a digital strategy could look like. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's for each person, I think it will be very different. For each context, it will be different. And I think it's really about the mindsets, actually, about how you approach um, everything you're doing and reframing digital, not just as the, the, the end goal. It's the, the method that helps you deliver the vision you already have. The, the mission you already have, um, it's not really changing that much actually. And I think when you have that perspective, it really does help you be a bit less fearful sometimes of, um, of digital. So maybe any questions on, this is not the most um, developed anything that, uh, that I've made, but it sort of helped us to um, outline what I was trying to say, this thinking about um, in preparation for today. What building a digital community Mm. means uh what does it mean it is uh i think that it it probably means many things but in my mind at least two uh a european capital of culture needs to say take care of those that are very familiar with the uh digital world mm -hmm. either they are working in cultural organizations, uh, freelancers, um, small and medium enterprises. Um, you may have a digital community over there. And perhaps this is not connected, but probably an ECOC should be aware of this, uh, say, growing and maturing group of people that work in a place. 
Mm -hmm. Second answer could go in the direction of the audience, the the audiences, uh, and the way the ECOC and its programs can can build uh, new audiences, can can, uh, uh, use all the uh, media, all the channels to, to connect people to the, to the program. Uh, feel free to go in one direction or the other, because we will have time uh, to go in the other direction. But can you answer that question, those questions, in fact? Um, so I think in terms of building digital communities, I would take it even back a step and maybe go in a third direction. If you don't mind, um, sure. but face oh well to start at least, and then I'll come back. Um, basically, to ask the question of: Do you need to build that digital community? Um, one of the main themes we heard um, from um, from our academy camp, and also working with your piano, we're working with a, a network of three and a half thousand people. I also work as a trustee of a network charity in Northern Ireland. Um, we we learn a lot about networks that we, you know, where with, with all good intentions, we want to bring people together and solve the big problems. But the question should be, do those communities need, those people might be disparate and maybe they don't necessarily need to come together. In some cases they do, and there can be a lot of value added, but the first step should be actually assessing their needs and assessing how you can help deliver those needs, I think. And um, I think that's always the really the really critical thing um, is to, to, to ask the question, like, what do you need and how can we actually help address this? Is a community one of the ways? And in terms of building a digital community, I think it's very interesting because, again, coming back to the main theme of digital being part of everything you're already doing um, and embedded in your in your approach, maybe the digital community is actually quite local and they're actually quite connected. but a digital element to that connectivity might be the method of communication. So maybe it could be a WhatsApp group, or maybe it's a they have a base camp or a Trello board to keep track of their local, you know, the local actions. Um, and in terms of those two audiences, the, those familiar with digi- like the digital world um, and those more general sort of audiences, um, I think the case still remains. You should be asking them exactly what their needs are. At least this is this is where I would I would uh, would start from, and then you can start delivering uh, in that sense. Um, and I think some of the key messages which also emerged from again from my own experience, but also from our academy camp and some of the amazing speakers on the academy camp, um, were that actually communities have a lifespan. Not everything will exist forever. I think it was Ella Cagle who said that you know communities have naturally a 1.5 year long lifespan. And, you know, you should prepare for this, that not all communities last forever, not all efforts will be um, long term. And also that when you are thinking of communities and if you do have this long term vision, then you also have to invest in this long term management and structure for that. Um, I I think Callum Bowden was uh, most forceful in stressing that actually communities do need a governance model of some description, whether that's co-governance um, ideally, co-governance also um, emphasized by Ella Cagle through a number of different tools you can use for co-governance and co-budgeting and co-planning, um, like cooperative, uh, sort of led by the cooperative. Um, nonetheless, a structure is needed and you have to invest in that structure, whether it's for your general audiences or for those familiar with the digital world. So um, I, I don't know if that answers the question completely, but I think it's it's. Um, actually understanding the needs that you're trying to to address and then when you understand the needs actually thinking then about that impact that vision of actually what the community what working with this community is for and what you want to achieve um in the end who are who are the members of a digital community in a in a city who they are who are they because i think you 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 say and i like the approach go and ask them what they need what if i do not know who they are Mm. how can i identify the members even if they do not call themselves members or uh yeah they are not aware 
that they will be labeled as members of a digital community. But mm -hmm. how can I identify them? Who are they? Um, I maybe will give you an example from where I am right now. Um, I'm in Northwest Ireland. I'm in a, a county called Donegal, the most beautiful place in the world, I can say. Um, and I know that <laughs> I, I, was, I am biased, of course, but um, you can say here that so this is a very rural community, but actually digital is a super important means of communication here. So, for example, my mum is constantly sharing me um, sharing with me uh, updates from the Facebook group, for example. And where I'm from in Northern Ireland, our local area are connected by a WhatsApp group. And so in a way, these are digital communities, because especially where I am from in Northern Ireland, there is no other sort of sense of community, especially where a divided community. So we don't have necessarily one place where both religions would come together, for example. But actually, the WhatsApp group is a place where everyone is connected. And this is really interesting as a, as a model. And this is if you said to people, oh, you're part of a digital community, 100 percent, they would say no. They would be like, what are you? You're talking about it's just it's a useful thing for them they understand what is happening they maybe find a gardener and maybe they you know there's a suspicious van somewhere but this actual idea of community is um is, is quite beautiful but they wouldn't identify as being in a digital community but the reason i know about this is because of asking my dad and my mum sharing information and likewise in in the republic of ireland where i am now this is you know my mum sharing things and and hearing um seeing things on facebook and other people posting and blah 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 events and a way of connecting with that community would be by using the method which they already use so joining and there's the authenticity which has to you know there's as a even as a you know i don't live in, in Donegal, but my family are from here there's an often an authenticity question of if i came in here and started asking people what they need what they what they desire you would wonder to what extent people would be a bit reluctant to, you know, to respond and say, who is this person? She is not from here. But I think, again, if you come with this with a, a real genuine, you know, approach and you ask people in, in a way that doesn't uh, alienate them and using a tool which they already use, I think this uh, it's a really uh, good way in. And I know we talked uh, with Chemnitz a lot about different community groups. They have really active local uh, like voluntary associations and um, I, I'm not sure if that's the right word for them, but they sort of local associations um, are quite active. And whether or not they're digital communities, um, the likelihood is that digital is already embedded in their communication. And so that would be a way of um, getting them in there. Again, does that is that answering any questions or it am does. I just telling you too many stories about Ireland at the moment? No, no, no. It does. It does. It's uh, well. It's a little bit worrying that uh, you 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 mentioned both products of uh, 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 yeah. Meta. Is this the name of yeah. the uh, now the the company? Uh, mm -hmm that owns WhatsApp and, 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 and Facebook. Mm -hmm. But don't worry, because I'm not asking any question on that. Uh, I'm sure that this question will, will come with uh, Paula Buet. Yes. We invited uh, her as representative of the Global Cities Coalition for Digital Rights. And I'm sure that she will address this question soon. Um, Maybe. I, Please. One thing on maybe one thing on this, we actually did address this also with Ella Cargill and um, I think also potentially with Callum Bowden, um, that the idea is that, you know, there are generally open source alternatives to all of the platforms we're using, for example, um, the, some of the co-budgeting and co-governance models, which Ella shared, are open source and not owned by the big five or three, I don't know how many we have now, um, not by the big companies. But she did emphasize that this takes a lot more time. Uh, you have to learn a new skill. This is a new literacy you have to develop to use these tools. And so, of course, the, the natural response is to go with the tools we already know. And unfortunately, those tools are exactly as you say, you know, uh, what they, they are, what they are at this present moment of time. But it's something which they also, um, Ella, is, I, I think it's Ella and Callum both stress that the tools you use to build a community and to connect a community are very much integral to actually what that community will look like. 
So if a community, if you use something which is, it takes a bit more time to learn, maybe it requires some coding or something like this, then there may be some exclusion of some people who are less confident with this. And in, in a similar way, if you use something everyone is using, then maybe everyone is there. But it also means that the tools you use actually set the values of your community as well. So if you go completely open source, maybe that's setting it as a real value statement as well, which is necessary for your community. So there's opportunities um, and things you need to think about, about the digital tools you might embrace in delivering a, um, a community effort or, or something like this. Yes, no, what you say is very interesting because that was, that was excellent, Nicole, Phew. thank you. At this point, Mercedes or Cristina, do you want to raise any question? I'm very curious as to what um, Nicola might uh, think of my, uh, let's say, existential query right now. Uh, you, you have generated an existential question in me, Nicole. You have, <laughs> well, you have said that, you know, if I, if I got it right, uh, digital tools, um, put it bluntly, at the service of a vision, right? But at the same time, um, a need for um, substantial change uh, mm -hmm. within the organizations uh, that want to apply uh, the, the, the yeah. digital strategy. So how do these two things go along? How do you put them together? You have a vision, but you need change. Uh, no, it's a fantastic question. Um, and it's something I'll, I'll refer back to my work in Europeana um, for this as well. And also with the, the crafts project, um, which is actually a project called Minge. I can share the, the, um, the link later. Um, yes, there is a need both for this vision, where you want to go, and then also the actual mechanisms to get you there. Um, and in Europeana, we, so we defined digital transformation and we made, um, again, focusing on mindsets as well as those tools you're using. So this sort of joint approach um com but if we understood digital transformation um as being enabled by developing capacity and whether you're you know whether these and we're, when we're talking about um changes we're talking about sometimes very large changes are needed but in any case any large changes is small, usually a series of small changes building up and so i think um and i also take this approach when it comes to um well if I think everyone takes this approach to learning. You do things in small pieces. And if you see it as a series of small changes, it's much less hard to, to embrace. Um, and this is why when we define digital transformation, we made a very specific sentence saying, actually, this any change is valuable. You know, you could be the Rijks Museum or you could be a volunteer-led museum. Whatever you do, this has an amazing value. This is part of your digital journey. And so... Um, in terms of those capacity building, I think it's it's also, and if I may reflect um, openly, um, sometimes capacity building and like learning is, is something as simple as reading a, an article and uh, or you know uh, 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 listening to going to Coursera, doing something like this. And I think people don't see the value in this sort of constant informal learning, also of sharing practices like we're doing today. So there are many ways to increase your capacity. Um, and of course, uh, get experts in when you need to as well, because you learn by working with experts as well. You learn by working with those people who are the digitization experts, who are the, the people who understand how to measure the force of air going through a piece of glass when it's being blown. You know, there's no way we're ever going to have that expertise. So I think, you know, seeing it as a, a number of different solutions to, to take you on that journey is, um, is a way forward. I'm not going to say it's the only way. but um, Hopefully that's resolving the, the crisis, but the vision is also needed as well uh, to get you to where you want to be, I think. And I see, sorry, Jordi. Yes, yes, uh, Christina has a question and perhaps Sylvain uh, has also a question. Feel free, Sylvain, to take the floor. Uh, Christina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole, for this first part of the afternoon. It was very interesting. And I have a, well, it's a question or a comment more or less, and it's somehow related to what Mercedes just asked. Because in my experience, I'm also very often caught into these existential crises when talking about digital, 
because, well, I work very much on this concept of audience development and digital is considered one of the strategic approaches to deliver audience development plans, audience development vision. And what is very often missing is this connection between the mission and the vision of an organization, of an institution, and the use of digital, which obviously is a tool, is a, is a group of tools, let's say, that need necessarily to be related to a vision and a mission. Otherwise, uh, there is, let's say, a lack of sense in using them without a strong anchor to vision and mission. But how difficult it is in your experience, because in my experience, it is very difficult to let institutions and organizations make this connection. There is still very much this idea that digital is the solution to all our problems yes. and that it is you know, sufficient to have a digital tool, to make something digital, to make a digital project, and we will solve every problem in terms of audience development, engagement of the communities, and so on and so forth. So do you also experience that difficulty in making it clear that digital needs to be related to the mission and the vision? Um, so your, it's, a, it's a really super comment question. Um, thank you so much. Um, I, I think it's... it's um, so you, you've you've made me think about something that I and I cannot think. I'm so sorry. I can't think exactly of the of the expression um, that I encountered during the complete lockdowns, some months or years. It's hard to know time anymore when this was. Um, but there was something about the 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 closer we get to having digital more embedded in all of our practices, it's almost like we go on a roundabout and we come back to understanding that the real value is about people and our connections and those things which we cannot replace through digital and so i think in a way maybe that's a natural it's 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 a shame it's not i don't think it's a shame there's a learning journey and there's a, a conceptual journey behind everything everything you, you work on you might there might be a lot of talking and blah 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 blah, blah. eventually you come to the right place and i think in some cases everyone has to go through that journey and maybe Mercedes this is part of uh, also from your question and um, everyone has to go through this journey of thinking oh digital is the solution and then realizing it's not and that yet yeah, you might have a great CRM or customer relationship management system um, but actually <laughs> you have no customers and uh, you come back to the question of actually um, okay I, we still need to build the relationships and I think maybe that um, it's, it's by no means that maybe there are ways of, of pushing people further in that in that learning process where they have to find this out themselves. Um, but I think I, I wish I could remember um, if I can find it in the break, I will. This expression of it's we're coming back to actually understanding the power of communicate like effective, authentic, genuine communication as humans, as being inclusive, as bringing people in. And digital is only a tool to help us deliver those relationships. And um, I hope that I don't think it's uh, by no it's by no means an answer. Um, but uh, I don't know. Does it does it help at all? Maybe you'll, you'll have some more time being very frustrated. <laughs> and and uh, eventually, no. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, it helps because I mean, this is exactly what what I sometimes think when I when I come through those problems and those difficulties. So thanks a lot. It's been of great comfort. Let's <laughs> good. Yeah. Oh. Sylvain, uh, vous voulez yeah. faire une question? Uh, yes, thank you. Please. <laughs> thank you, Jordi. And, and thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, I was very pleased also that you started your, your presentation with the word uh, people, because we tend to um, to say that uh, digital is all about technologies, but it's also very much uh, about, about people. So th thank you for making the, the connection. You spoke a lot about the digitization of artifacts in museums, for example, but we could also speak about the, the web streaming of uh, performances. Uh, um, that's always using uh, digital as a, a tool, but somehow we could also use, uh, we can and we do use digital for uh, 
producing new uh, new artifacts, new uh, cultural expressions. So it's not um, a digital as a tool, it's more digital as a mean to produce yeah. something new. And I would like you to elaborate a little bit more about digital, digital art. Absolutely. Um, I also on this, um, uh, sorry, just one second, I will very quickly share my screen again. Also under place and process, I had in here contemporary heritage, which absolutely we're making digital, we're making heritage constantly, um, and especially in a digital context. And uh, what else was I going to highlight? Somewhere, sorry to look past my computer to the screen. Um, something else. Um, but absolutely, in terms of, I remember speaking to, um, I spoke recently with um, uh, Micah Verbeek, who is the director of um, DEN in the Netherlands. So they support the digitization of the Dutch cultural sector. And her biggest um, challenge was that, you know, now COVID is finishing, fin <laughs> fingers crossed, let's, uh, let's all hope. Um, now that, you know, we can go to concerts again, now we can, uh, you know, uh, have some sort of normal life again. Um, people are forgetting about the opportunities of digital and the, the positives that it did bring during those um, horrendous times, but they are forgetting the opportunities and the skills that, you know, they have developed these skills, then why can't they have, you know, this sort of hybrid program where they have something live and also uh, in terms of streaming. And um, I think the, um, the I, 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 to some extent, I see that this is this is the case, um, and I, I also I also regret this. I also wish that, for example, I'm again from Northern Ireland, and we have a really fantastic theatre tradition, and I was able to watch theatre in Northern Ireland, living in the Netherlands, and this was fantastic, and I can't do that anymore, and I have to come and visit, which is also good, but I, you know, they've they've lost that. They've lost that and I paid for those productions you know I paid for that access um so in a way there's um there's definitely things which are being lost um which we should uh, sort of build into this idea this hybrid programming um but again it is also responding it should also respond to audiences maybe for some people this didn't really work for their audiences for others it did that's uh, again follow the data follow follow what you've learned um I think there's something really important and maybe also coming back to the idea of um, that we talked about earlier, these different alternative platforms and new ways of thinking. And I think also Paola will have some uh, something to add to this, I hope, um, that actually maybe this is also an opportunity to reconsider, not necessarily, and I will not, I will not uh, like for example, intellectual property is a, an amazing part of um, the, creating the revenues, uh, much needed revenues for creators. But there are alternative ways of sharing digitized content as well, which might open up new um, business models in a digital context as well. So there are opportunities by this digitization of sort of contemporary culture, and contemporary performing arts and, and, um, and everything around this that um, could be explored. And I wonder, is, is, there any, is there anything else that I can respond to that I haven't responded to, uh, Silva? Or is that, is that okay? Yeah, super. Super. Thank you for the question. Good. Yes, good, good. No, we, we are progressing. Some of the of the questions that have already been posed were related to questions we had uh, previously agreed, Nicole, that I would I would uh, suggest. Um, but that's fine. Um, let let me ask you uh, on examples of outstanding projects you have been involved, not necessarily in European capitals of culture, but mm -hmm. that you believe they are truly inspirational, uh, remarkable examples of today's uh, relation between the vision and the mission of a cultural institution or a cultural event and uh, the, digital, the digital world. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, um, I have a really wonderful example. I hope it's, I, I think it's wonderful. Um, I'm working with a museum at the minute, the Haus des Seidenkultur. Uh, Sorry, my German is terrible with the Dutch accent now. Um, uh, the House of Silk, um, Silk Culture in, um, in Krefeld in Germany, quite close to the Netherlands Dutch border, actually. I absolutely have loved working with this organization because everyone there who works there is over 75. 
and they are involved in a digitization project. And this is through a European funded project called Mingay. And they are absolutely, uh, I've really only become part of this project in the past year, and I have absolutely loved working with everyone there. Um, in particular, the uh, what we call them HDS, because uh, my German is terrible, in HDS, um, they have really embraced everything. Um, it has really overwhelmed everything they expected. They had really, they, you know, they were involved, they were happy to be involved in a European project. Of course, this was the first time they had been involved. So really the expectations of what was needed was, was quite overwhelming. Um, and only one person who's only one volunteer is is actually confident in speaking English. So there's a there's a language barrier. Um, there are many other, you know, they many of them don't use Zoom. They, uh, whenever COVID came, they had no way of, they, some of them don't have emails. So they had so many things to overcome. And the, you know, um, Mercedes also, you know, the, we talked about these small changes. To see these small changes that have, um, that have this small museum, volunteer led, all over 75, that they have taken and the connections, and it's not just about the changes they've made, but the connections they've made to their wider city, that they have now, these, they have been part of the development of a local app for their city. So they have, you know, added content and, um, you know, put points on the map that should be part of the city tour. Um, and they, you know, they're engaging on a European level. They're thinking about the preservation of their, this heritage that many of them have worked in um, as practitioners. And they know that, you know, they're, they're getting older and this heritage needs to be preserved. And so it's, it's absolutely inspiring as an example of these really small but super significant changes that have so much value and I think in if you if you would situate that for example within um, a European capital of culture context then I think in any way of supporting those even further connections building their capacity even maybe through new volunteers and getting a younger generation of people into to you know to keep the the legacy of this craft going this museum operating and you know supporting these volunteers in their um, you know in the digital the work they have to do around the digital products would be um, super. And I think it's um, yeah I, I really uh, recommend. Uh, it's just uh, for me this is a really inspiring example to work with. Everyone is so passionate and so open to digital, even though they're so you know they don't some people don't have email addresses. And so this is this is really um, it was the first time I'd worked on a, a museum if I if I can say that. Uh, small that's so volunteer led that doesn't have a you know a professional um uh it's not professionally led if you know if you if, i don't want to say it's not professional because it very much is um uh, they're doing an amazing job but if you understand what they mean it's not a salaried uh you know they have no salaried staff and this was really um fascinating and inspiring Thank you very much. Very good example. It's uh, uh, yeah, I'm relieved that uh, an example of uh, people that are not digital native uh, deserves uh, your your uh, well, your you highlight that that example, N not not. Yeah. Uh, other examples that I'm sure you have from from people that are uh, younger and um, very people who have a lot of experience in this. But I, I wanted to emphasize that it's the value of the change is relative to to you and your context. So you can't expect every every museum to become the Rijksmuseum or SMK in Denmark. You can't expect everyone to transform into, into this. It's all about you know the diversity as well about supporting the diversity of what is there. So. Um, yeah, um, maybe I will. There's one final thing which um, I find quite interesting, maybe on the topic of digital and to come back to something that some, someone I cannot remember mentioned earlier, which was because um, I know we're almost about to finish, was that um, ECROCs have this real um, uh, opportunity in that actually, you know, we don't know what will happen in five to 10 years time. It, and this could be around data collection. Um, and Paolo will probably remember that when we discussed data collection in our academy camp, we had this idea, we don't know what data collection will look like in five years time, 10 years time. We don't know what we'll be doing with it. We won't know our own skills or the platforms we might use to analyze and present this data. 
um, or how data collection will be embedded in what we do. At the same time, we also don't know um, what cultural performance will look like in, in five, 10 years time, what digital will look like when it's more embedded in cultural performance, production, developments and research, research and developments. So there are super opportunities in ECOX, whereas normal project funding is so short that you don't actually have this long life cycle. And I think ECOX have this real, um, they can be this real hotbed for um, R&D research and developments um, uh, going forward. And I think maybe I'll end with that. But that was something that really struck me from our academy camp, um, this real opportunity. Good, thank you. I, I hope that we have not blocked the server of the Mingay project uh, with uh, almost all of us clicking at the link you I provided. <laughs> I can explain why if, uh, if, if, if it's happened. If they ask, uh, identify yourself as the, as the, the responsible for that. <laughs> Unusual uh, peak in the uh, yeah, consultation of the website. Nicole, um, isn't it all this too expensive or very expensive? I mean, augmented reality, um, uh, this is expensive. Hmm. Um, yes, um, we did cover this also in our academy camp. And this is something um, we've done many surveys, for example, again, I speak in the museum context about barriers to digital transformation. And much of it comes down to cost mm -hmm. and whether that's cost of the technology or cost of the time it takes to, to hire someone or to invest in training or to actually work on, on this. Um, we, we heard from uh, Ashtapana and I forgot, I'm so sorry, I've forgotten his second name, um, from Brain Studio in the Czech Republic. Um, he was saying that actually, again, looking at this time scale, we will start to see um, devices becoming cheaper. Like we're already seeing quite high functioning phones becoming much, much cheaper. Um, and we will start to see progress in this regard. And we, it may be, you know, I know, I remember that when the Google glasses kept got a bit popular and then they completely disappeared because uh, safety concerns, I think, and probably also data privacy. Um, um, we do anticipate that devices and, uh, things which are actually accessible to people will become much cheaper. But then you also have different models, for example. So I'm going to talk about, uh, so Stepana had um, mentioned a, I will send a link, I've completely forgotten what it's called, um, a link to something which, um, it was like an immersive theater performance. They sent you, like a, it was like a theater takeaway. They sent you the, um, the, the, the headset to wear and you experienced it in your home and it was delivered to your house. So it's like a theater takeaway. And then of course you give the headset back. Um, but this is actually quite an affordable way of taking, taking something to people. These devices can be used again. Of course, there is an initial investment, but if that investment becomes lower at, in the future, which it is anticipated, then um, yeah, it will cost money, but uh, everything costs money. Um, and I think it's about, uh, priorities and if you see a way of digital like, again thinking back to that impact and the vision and the people you're trying to serve if you see that digital uh, a tool can help you deliver a stronger impact for that audience then you know there's a prioritization um which you'll have to do but that this is a natural part of making a budget good we could listen uh right now to anna from chemnitz uh, paolo and becky from matera uh two cities european capitals of culture both um and to a network of cities an emerging network of cities paula Buet representing barcelona city council as leader of this city's coalition for digital rights uh first is anna um as uh, i said we have heard great things of your digital strategy congratulations you have been not that recently appointed uh, but still, congratulations for this recognition. And let us know what you're planning. Anna, you have the, the floor. Thank you very much, um, Jordi. Uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation uh, also for us, for, for organizing also this last academy camp. Happy to be here. 
Um, yeah, as you already said, my, num my name is uh, Anne Kurzweil. I hope you hear me okay. I work for Chemnitz 2025. I've been involved in uh, writing the second bit book in well, everything related to the long-term strategy, the narrative, transformation process, evaluation, and so on. So um, today I'm here to give you uh, an overview on our ideas uh, for digitalization, and the role that it plays in our program and our process, and a little bit where we stand. I tried to make it short, but let's see if I can keep the time. Uh, you can just uh, interrupt me or just ask me questions maybe at the end, uh, the best. So um, yeah, let me briefly go back to uh, digitalization, why it's so important in our bit book. Um, yeah, as you know, as we've stated already, digitalization has been an important topic for quite uh, some time, even before the pandemic. We also know that many cities and, and uh, organizations of any kind uh, struggle with it somehow. It's, it's always a topic that is sometimes difficult. It has a lot of opportunities, but also yeah, a lot of, of obstacles come with it and, and so on. So we said, okay, this is uh, really a big chance, uh, ACOG title hosting for one year. This is a really a big international event and a great opportunity to really make a shift in the sense uh, throughout the city. Yeah. So, um, and additionally, of course, we were writing the second bid book in, in 2020, which is just when the pandemic uh, hit and we, we've, yeah, we felt the, the impact uh, uh, on our own bodies. <laughs> Yeah, and moving to the digital workspace and, and seeing how the cultural sector was handling the situation. And of course, watching also um, a bit painfully the, the other ACOGs, uh, especially of 2020, that were having uh, such a hard time to deliver their, their programs that, that they had prepared for 2020. So it, uh, it was just a confirmation and a reinforcement, let's say, to really put digitalization uh, in the big book and put it in chapter one in the beginning that it's really important. We we said okay let's how, how can we do that, that like like let's use the the ECOC, um, like as an opportunity to rethink right the, to find new ways how we work digitally uh, in culture especially let's make uh, did <laughs> thanks for the background music <laughs> um, yeah let's make um, a digital splash in terms of, of capacities of people of skills. Uh, let's find ways how we can create international impact uh, in the digital sphere and, and seizing the opportunities that digital uh, offers there. Uh, but we also realized that that would take a big learning process uh, in the city and all different sorts of actors. I mean, we're not all uh, digitally uh, natives, digital natives and uh, yeah, so, so we just knew that in the, be it in the city administration, be it in our project partners from the program, uh, we would need to build capacity and we would want to use that chance. And at the same time, we thought, okay, uh, it cannot be just like ticking a box, right? It, it's, it's not, that's not emotional, that's not uh, uh, interesting. So, so what would be the, the motivation for everyone to, to really uh, get to grips with that? Huh? And, and we, we therefore looked for, for a conceptual link with our narrative of, of our bid book. As you may know, our, our, the motto of our, of our bid and our, our project is see the unseen European makers of culture and democracy. It's basically like in a really short sentence about celebrating creativity in, in everyone and, and bringing people together about this, around this, this joy of, of making things, of being creative. So um, at, the, at the heart of our cultural program, uh, we have like an overarching concept uh, that, that frames this, this entire cultural program, which is the European Workshop for Culture and Democracy. And let's say it, it's, it's sort of our, it's like the mechanism of our transformation process, if you, if you want to. It's like our, our approach. And it basically means that, that the whole process process of making our program and delivering it uh, in the end in 2025 uh, should be like uh, it's, it's the idea is like it's like a workshop okay so it's similar to the creative hubs and the co-working spaces and, and so on um, it, it's a place where we we want to discover our own abilities we want to work with others we want to learn together from each other we see it as a process where where we can 
exchange with others that are uh, even coming from quite different places than, than ourselves in, in many different senses. Um, and it's also a place where old stuff can get reused, right? <laughs> like, it, like the invisible, unseen things become useful again somehow. Uh, let's say it, it could be local history uh, or personal stories in, in the light of a European context or European history, but but also maybe discovering. Um, yeah, in in, in, our, in the case of Chemnitz, it's, it's very interesting to to rethink or discover. Uh, what discourses or, or uh, social structures and relations are are existing and are invisible, especially in the digital world, uh, that that were yeah that they were hidden and, until something like like August two thousand eighteen happened, where suddenly they 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 turned to the to the analog world, let's say, and and we saw thousands of people on the street that uh, yeah were invisible before. So, so that's. Um, yeah, that, that's the idea of the European Workshop for Culture and Democracy, more or less, <laughs> in a nutshell. And uh, it, it just means that we we realize that we need to think in a hybrid way from the beginning. So so we say, okay, so we need uh, like sort of a tool or something that uh, yeah to make it happen. And that that then we came up with this idea of the European Digital Makerspace. Which is basically like the, the idea of the workshop, but it's a, a focus on the digital um, space. And uh, yeah, right now, so we were we are developing it. Uh, the the concept is slowly being developed. And let's say we we could say it has like uh, three aspects: the implementation of this idea. Um, one is the capacity building and then the training of skills. Another one is, is building, let's say, the digital community. Uh, around makers, uh, uh, I will explain that later. And uh, and the last one would be like a, like creating a platform. Like this digital maker space is it a is it a physical thing? Is it just a virtual thing? Is it one thing? Is it a connection of different tools? So this sort of platform network, whatever it will be, should be uh, developed as well. So regarding the first point, the capacity building. It's about developing digital skills and developing also, let's say, hybrid thinking. Um, when we were talking before, I, I thought that uh, this this how this question how we move between the analog and the digital world or realities, uh, it's it's not often so clear really, and how they link together, how they where the opportunities are to um, the point where where they come together. That is something that is sometimes a bit hard to think. So this is uh, the, let's say the, the aim of the capacity building, um, which as I said before, should be at a very different level and with many involving different, uh, many different stakeholders. Um, like apart from, yeah, so, so shortly after winning, winning the title, let's say in the beginning of 2021, we, yeah, we were offered the opportunity of uh, hosting the academy camp. It was uh, quite early for us, but we said, okay, let's let's see. And we had at that stage already made uh, like a, a short, really brief needs analysis uh, amongst yeah, in the team and some other colleagues at the city, city administration and also project partners that, that we knew. That okay, so what what if, if we started now with the capacity building? Like what what would your focus be? What what is the biggest need? And yeah, surprise, actually digitalization came out as like the, the most important thing. So um, so we had the, the academy camp, which was really great. Uh, as I said that before in another <laughs> presentation, but it's really uh, like a, it brought together a lot of ideas and uh, conversation starters, let's say. It covered a really broad bandwidth of, of topics hybrid digital um, of marketing communication of com building communities and so on so it really it really helped us to move forward and um, yeah in the meantime now like th that was last year like taking place and and in the meantime we have been building up our organizational structures and and, and so on so now we have uh, actually now a team of project developers that are starting to work with our uh, like really um, working on the development uh, process of our projects that are in the bit book uh, to bring them into to shape and a state where they can be 
you know, um, presented and try out their things and, and so on. And this is taking place now. So uh, we are looking at right now where the projects are. And we think that from like beginning summer, more or less, we, we can start with like really offering trainings that are tailor made to the needs uh, of our project partners, which uh, no doubt will, <laughs> will have uh, a digital dimension, of course. Um, we, we actually touched there in the academy camp these some topics that I think are, are particularly interesting for the project partners, topics like digital marketing and, and communication but also the hybrid programming, uh, developing the digital aspects of the projects, which uh, we think is still uh, sort of a weakness, right, of our program. And then, of course, these links, like how, how do you use digital tools for audience development and, and even project management? Uh, then the second part, building the community. Um, our project is about connecting makers as I said before. So it's, it's about building relations that are based on, yeah, on the joy of, of being creative uh, across all other differences um, between people that are so different that usually they would not, uh, they're not likely to connect with each other. That, that's the magic <laughs> that we would like to happen, right? So, so the big question is like, how, how do we start building such a community? And we have some ideas, we have some pilot projects that we're trying out. We had the really brilliant um, uh, conversations and, and input from the experts, uh, Ella Kagel and uh, Colin Bowden, as you said, Nicole, before. It was really uh, very interesting how to focus on, on the individual needs of those communities. And yeah, we think, um, yeah, we, we think of building a maker community but we, at the same time, we think we need to connect those makers that are already that already know each other in the local um, in the local area uh, digitally. I mean, of course, they they connect. You know, with <laughs> they go to a garage and have a beer together, maybe, or they are in a co-working space, or they have a WhatsApp group together. But then, how do we connect them more? That that's a process that we're that we're still uh, figuring out, and. We, we think that it needs to come uh, like bottom up. It's not something that you can plan top down and say, okay, now we're gonna, but that was one of the big learning points from the academy camp actually, that you need to see where, where the needs are and then see how it can grow. So now of course we are, in our, in our daily work, we are building a lot of relationships. We are connecting people. We are connecting ourselves with a lot of people. We, we, need to, we need a CRM <clears throat> management system that we want to have for a long term, uh, like that want to remain as a legacy and, and, and stuff like that. Um, and we, of course, we need the audience development strategies to develop uh, from each project and also on a program level. So there we are um, quite at the beginning, I would say, right? And the third part is the, the platform. There uh, we have had a, a roadmap. So, so we had um, like a process where we consulted different uh, experts, international best practice, uh, people from the local context, um, just to see what, what they think, how, they, how that could look like. What would a makerspace.eu look like? Is it a website? Is it whatever? So we know that it, uh, we want, the ECOG website not to be Chemnitz 2025 anymore because in 2026 it will not be so interesting to go to that website, right? That's why it's a makerspace EU. Um, we know that it should be a big tool to reach our audiences, connect the makers um, for communication, for events and uh, ticketing, of course, all the, the usual things, let's say. But um, we are still testing and trying out what, what could be the ideal format, right? For example, we have uh, this summer a festival, which is uh, Makers United in, in summer. And this festival has started just as a, as a pilot, a website where, it present, where different makers can present themselves. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a first step. It's not interactive yet, really, unfortunately, but, uh, but still, um, yeah, we have some stakeholders 
uh, trying out what it could look like and learning from this uh, from this experience. And you also, yeah, you you mentioned that you're you're working with makers. I yeah. think I'm familiar with this concept, but I'm not. I'm. I'm I would be happy if you can explain <laughs> a little bit more. Yes, who they are. It's a good question. So for so we we say um, okay. So the, there's the usual makers, you know that. Yeah, you, you think they're in a fab lab and, and so on. But we said, uh, no, we think a maker can, like everyone is a maker. Whoever um, has an ability to do something is a maker. So it, it doesn't matter if you're really good at cooking or at knitting or at um, working in a metal workshop. So so if you do if you do something or if you're, you know, hidden away in your garage, uh, transforming an old car, for example. You, they are all makers. And that is what, um, it's really broad. But the idea is that this really broad uh, identification of opportunity, let's say, connects people, right? So that many people can, can connect, as a, can identify as a maker. So um, yeah, just just to finish, that the Maker Festival, for example, it starts with a well, from the from a format which was the Maker Fair, like a yeah, like a oh, sorry, forgot the word, yeah, like just a normal fair, you know, where with stands where people present what they're doing. But we start incorporating other sorts of makers so that uh, people can start to connect with the with that idea. Um, other state stakeholders just uh, regarding the platform. So we have more ideas coming uh, up now from the city, uh, more projects, of course, but also regarding the, the platform. So someone was saying, okay, I want to create a platform for let's say matchmaking, yeah, for people that want to finance culture or some, some projects and others that, that need the money. So we say, okay, nice idea. And now let's see how we can bring everything together into one thing that works. Um, yeah, and we have more ideas. Um, yeah, like a, ha a hackathon we would like to do with the uh, young digital makers uh, to see what their ideas are. And, and generally speaking, the, the ideas is, uh, is always to bring together as uh, many different perspectives, perspectives as possible to develop our, our project uh, and, and our, our approaches. And uh, the last point that I want to say is that, yeah, we would like the, the platform or hub or whatever it, 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 will, it will be, we would like it to be connected to an open data platform. And that was a very good uh, best practice example that we had from Matera, where they told us uh, how they used uh, the open data. And we have the idea of, of, make, of collecting data and making it at the same time available uh, for project makers. Uh, to, to, to use, yeah, where where specific people meet or what what they like or whatever data we can collect, yeah. So that that's something that we are about to develop as well. And uh, I think maybe my time is up. <laughs> um, yeah, thank okay. you. And if you have any questions, thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. That was very complete. Uh, let me share with you what, that we have a person whose name is uh, Sarah, Sarah, in the waiting room. Uh, if you know who she is, uh, please let us know with a bilateral message uh, in the chat uh, to, to myself or to Sarah Vieux. As we had this incident this morning, we are not letting in people that we do not know or uh, has previously registered. So if you're waiting for somebody, you know, whose name is Sara, let us know, please. Um, now we go to Matera. Uh, Paolo and Becky, Paolo first. You, you uh, Hello, representing everyone. Matera. You yeah. have been recognized by some of the previous speakers in previous sessions as uh, for various reasons, as an example. Uh, European Capital of Culture, uh, one of those that stay in the golden history of ECOC. Uh, with this responsibility, I give you the floor. <laughs> and uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for the invitation, and thank you very much for uh, um, having us in uh, in this um, very interesting um, event. Uh, well. Uh, 
actually um, we are going to present you and share with you some um, uh, something that is uh, um, an action for the future or currently ongoing and uh, Becky uh, more precisely will go into some uh, uh, something that has happened but that we would like to to continue in the future and i'm very happy that uh, you know uh, it, it seems that it was uh, prepared but it was not uh, that after han uh, that han was closing with this uh, reference to the open data and i'm actually uh, starting to introduce you the um, uh, project we are uh, working on that is called culture data just a little um, point here that of course in uh, uh, today myself and also Becky we are representing an organization that is based in Matera and it's called Matera Hub uh, which has been uh, working uh, with uh, uh, the, the, the process of the European capital of culture and then Becky of course you know her she has been actively part of the team that has run the, the European capital of culture. Um, we had uh, a very uh, particular interest in understanding how to valorize the, um, the European capital of culture uh, format as a, uh, an opportunity for experimentation in very different fields, um, particularly in the area that refers to um, the creative and cultural sector. Uh, the project that I'm presenting you and that we are working now is a project funded uh, by a program of the European Commission that is not related directly to culture, which is the COSME uh, program. Uh, and the name of the project, as I was saying at the beginning, is Culture Data. Um, the framework where we are working is uh, the framework of a program that wants to support uh, the uh, companies in the uh, tourism sector to overcome all the difficulties of the um, last two years by fostering a process of a digital transition. But um, as we did in a uh, previous uh, occasion, we wanted to uh, take the chance of this uh, program to try and uh, bring uh, an experimentation that had to do with uh, uh, the network of European capital of culture. So with this excuse and together with uh, uh, a pool of a very good partner, we um, started to uh, to work in uh, uh, January of this year in the Culture Data Project. Just to give you an idea of who are the partners and why this project is relevant for the ecosystem of European Capital of Culture. Uh, apart from Matera as a city, we have the colleague from Chemnitz as well involved in the project. There are uh, previous Capital of Culture like Leoarden or Kosice, uh, there are also cities that applied to be European Capital of Culture as Leiria in Portugal, but didn't succeed in the first round. And uh, regions like Extremadura in Spain that are starting a slow, slow process towards uh, becoming uh, one of the candidates uh, uh, for the, the ECOC when the, the turn for Spain will come again. Um, Now, the, the project had uh, uh, a clear starting point. European capital of culture are in um, a path of uh, eight years, 10 years, five years, depending on when the process of uh, the cities, uh, when starts and when it stops, are pro producing an enormous amount of data. Uh, these data have to do with uh, several aspects. They have to do with uh, uh, economic sectors, they have to do with culture, they have to do with the engagement of the community, they have to do with uh, um, connection uh, uh, with policy maker. So um, starting from what we experienced here in Matera, uh, where there was um, an issue with uh, uh, collecting and putting all the data in the same place. The data that were coming, for example, on the tourism uh, sector from uh, the, uh, the companies, from uh, the uh, restaurants, 
the data that had the municipality, the data that had the um, uh, agency for promotion of tourism. So uh, what we really wanted to do was to try and understand how to valorize this data, understanding where they are, understanding what we can do with this data in order to make the process and the path of European capital of culture something that is able to have um, not only a, a process that is uh, under control, monitored, uh, and able to take uh, uh, different uh, uh, different path should uh, the, the, the program need to be um, reorganized, but also to understand what is the impact of the European capital of culture, and not only on the area of culture, but on uh, other economic sectors, uh, primarily tourism and the creative industry side of uh, the, the, the creative and cultural sectors. Um, what is the engagement of the population, how the population is perceiving this um, or big, big uh, phenomenon and an event that is happening in their town. And we would like to uh, make sure that the teams that are working in European Capital of Culture, they know uh, and they are able to put together all the players that can have something to say about, uh, about this topic. Of course, because when the ECOC is over, then we are talking about legacy, but legacy can be strong only if there is a clear understanding of what the process has been, uh, a clear uh, capacity to show the impact of what happened and uh, also the work of policymaker after a European capital of culture can really be uh, facilitated because there are data available and data that are interpreted and collected. So uh, what we are going to do, the first step of this project is about informing European capital of culture of what we want to do. So in these days, we are uh, sending out uh, uh, in letter uh, an, an invitation to colleagues in uh, what we call the ECO ecosystem, which for us is not only the network of cities that have been awarded as European capital of culture, but also the network of the cities that apply to be European Capital of Culture or are thinking to be uh, uh, applicant for the bid. Why this? Because the uh, knowledge that is produced in the process is so incredible. And of course, you know, I don't have to tell you because uh, the, the, the work that we have done is a, uh, has made this so visible. Uh, that, of course, we are very much very interested not only in what the the city that have succeeded are doing, but also on what is happening in cities that maybe have not uh, been selected uh, and how all these things can really support the others. So uh, the first thing is something like a network and we prefer to call it ecosystem because it's, uh, uh, you know, it's something that is really having several connections with several stakeholders. The second action that has just started is the creation of an observatory, a pilot observatory for now, because the project will be a two years project and we are trying to understand how to set up something more uh, you know, forward looking, which we, call, we are calling ECOC Watch. And the ECOC Watch will start to analyze uh, how European capital of culture have been dealing with the data have been dealing with the topic of impact measurement, have been dealing with uh, um, the, the collection and the, and the use of uh, information that were able to show the impact of the European capital of culture on several aspects, as I was saying before, not only cultural consumption or audience engagement, but also uh, local development, tourism development, the creation of new companies in the creative sector, uh, and all this kind of information. The ECOC Watch uh, has a board of uh, researcher uh, experts that have been working with a specific eye on uh, the topic of impact uh, inside the European capital of culture and the topic of monitoring. Uh, as well as experts of creative industries and tourism, because the two sectors that in this project are 
for first under the, the light uh, for the echo watch are these two sectors. And of course, as I was saying before, we don't simply want to create a, a, an observatory that is collecting data and maybe pub and publishing um, reports and paper, but we would like to also connect uh, all this information with the, the level of policymakers that should really be the one who are able to take the most out of the data and design new policies that could really make the process starting with an application for the European Capital of Culture a process that will have an impact on a territory, on a region or on a city that could last uh, more than 10 years. Uh, this activity in particular will be coordinated by the colleagues in Chemnitz, and it will be about uh, uh, really trying to understand how the data can influence uh, the policy level of uh, uh, the cities that are involved. As I was saying, this project is um, as it is 24 months. We started in January. We are going to have uh, uh, several activities, not all uh, um, related to uh, ECOC uh, cities, some of them related to stakeholders that are working inside the European Capital of Culture. But uh, our ambition is to start from this first pilot observatory, which will be the ECOC Watch, and working together with the uh, ecosystem of cities that we might have uh, uh, engaged during these two years trying to see if the model of the observatory could really become something that the cities are uh, developing and starting uh, every time they would like to uh, participate in uh, the process of European capital of culture. Uh, and we think that it's not because it, it's not because it's uh, one of the things that uh, the commission is requiring for a city to uh, to participate in the in the competition that uh, um, this kind of uh, data collection and elaboration should happen we strongly believe that uh, the um, the capacity to understand uh, what are the relevant data, where, where they are, who are the players that are using this data, uh, how to process them, how to valorize. These are all things that every city, not only European Capital of Culture, might need in order to design their uh, uh, you know, development in, in the following years in different sectors. Um, we would uh, try to continue uh, make the community of uh, uh, ECOC uh, grow and be connected with other initiatives that might come from uh, different uh, uh, other sources and different other European programs. And in this, uh, Becky will uh, uh, tell you something, something more, uh, trying to maximize and connect uh, uh, individual projects that the cities are doing together with uh, uh, other initiatives that have happened in a way that we can ensure to very valuable and very uh, relevant initiatives the capacity to survive the uh, process and the experience that the city is living. Uh, and the other thing is that, of course, um, the, the project Culture Data is trying to create a, a, a connection between uh, the actors, the stakeholders from private and public sectors that uh, are uh, active in uh, two of the sectors that, uh, you know, are the one on which it might be easier to uh, start working and uh, start uh, valorizing the, the, the information and the data collected uh, in, uh, uh, in the process, which are culture, of course. And so the impact of a European capital of culture in the cultural and creative dimension of a city and a region, uh, a different level. And of course, tourism. And I mean, uh, here in Matera, we, had, uh, uh, we have some experience on how a European capital of culture can really boost uh, tourism. Uh, and make uh, uh, a city become visible on uh, the map of the European destination. Um, so th this is uh, about uh, uh, the, the work that is happening now. Um, of course, for the colleagues that are following the, um, uh, the, this um, event, uh, we will have 
um, one uh, uh, we, we are launching uh, in this moment the campaign as I was saying for cities that are interested in uh, understanding a little more about what we are doing so showing interest through some uh, letter of support and then um, in uh, Matera on the 9th and 10th of June we are going to uh, have uh, an event which will be a hybrid event of course uh, where we will try to cover different aspects related uh, not only to the specific work of the cultural data project, but in general about the concept of uh, uh, how a European capital of culture is able to generate impact on uh, the, the local economy outside the purely cultural dimension. Now, I leave the floor to Becky. Thanks again, Jordi, for this opportunity. It's been a really interesting session. Um, resonated with a lot of things that Nicole spoke about and also Anna as well. Um, so my name is Becky, as Paolo said, I work for Matera Hub, but I was also, I've been a member of the Matera 2019 Foundation um, since 2018. And I also ran uh, Project Managed and Erasmus Plus um, vocational um, training project for them until um, a couple of months ago. So we still work very closely with the foundation. Um, I wanted to just share, I guess, um, a reflection um, that has developed slowly over the last couple of years about what we can do in terms of developing legacy for ECOX and specifically how to create, how to leverage the digital opportunities that we have to develop legacy. It, it's a really important part of the ECOX because we put so much effort, we put our hearts and souls into making the ECOX programs um, happen. They're an emotional episode, I think, for most people that run them um, because they really believe in building um, opportunities in their territory and, and making a difference for the local citizens. Um, and a lot of money is put into the um, ECOX as well. And that's another reason why we need to make sure that we make the most of any legacy opportunity that we have. And um, the, the reflection I have is that there's two ways to go. Um, you know, there's there's the sharing element of what we've done and, you know, very much linked to uh, the project Paolo shared now called Toldata, um, and also the open data platform that the Matera 2019 organization um, created, the monitoring reports, you know, sharing what you've learned and the knowledge that is really important. But it's also about developing on what's been on, what, on what's been created over those years. And, uh, and that's, I think, where it becomes really challenging for many, for many reasons. Um, uh, the focus on the vision of the the year after the ECOC, I think, is sometimes difficult to do because the work is just so immense to actually um, uh, plan and implement an ECOC year. Um, uh, and I think there's a mixture of opportunities that come out of ECOCs. Um, if I if I focus on Matera, for example, we have some spontaneous legacy activities that are digital. We have um, ECOC News, for example, which is an online um, platform um, to share uh, the news of ECOC's past, present and future that has been launched spontaneously on a volunteer basis by the ex um, press officer for the Matera 2019 Foundation. And that's a really lovely example. But then we have other legacy um, spin offs that have been spontaneous. The um, volunteer organization for Matera 2019 was. Um, significant, impressive, um, uh, energetic, um, and they all loved each other, hundreds of them together on one WhatsApp group, and it worked. I don't know how the volunteer manager managed it, but it worked. Um, but, but then we also need to think about focusing on, on planning the development of legacy and how that can be done. And uh, it was interesting what Nicole said about um, there's almost a mismatch in the life, the life cycles of projects. So we have ECOP, which is um, a 10 year journey from the beginning to the end. It's a long time, especially when you can you, you put it up against Erasmus Plus two, three, four year projects. Um, and yet there are lots of opportunities within uh, European funding to develop further ideas. Um, if you can go on to the next slide, uh, slide Paolo, that would be great. Thank you. Um, 
which um, can help us um, build further what we've learned, harness the experience that we've gained and share it. So I just wanted to share this example of something that was done by Matera 2019 through um, a vocational centres of excellence uh, pilot of Erasmus Plus project called DELS. Um, it was inspired, it's a legacy of Matera 2019. It was inspired by the um, pillar project called Open Design School, um, which I think many of you might have already heard of. And I, and I know cer certainly many of you know my colleague Rita Orlando, who drove that project. Um, the idea of this school um, was that it created a multidisciplinary, peer to peer, informal, uh, challenge based applied learning environment. Very practical, very pragmatic. And our inspiration for Dales was well, how can we upscale? This worked locally. It had a specific mandate. It had to produce the infrastructure that we needed to implement the program, but it had the potential as a methodology to go further. How could we do that? And we could do that through Dell. So we could do that by, by, by launching it online. We could do that by working with other ECOC partners. So we involved um, uh, past, present and future. We had Malta, Paulus, Kozica, uh, with us as well as other partners, experienced partners, to, to rewrite the methodology so that it could be used in any context and then to create also a digital map um, to allow uh, the experimentation that we carried out throughout that project through our living labs to be shared to illustrate what opportunities there are for upscaling some of the experience that we gain throughout the life cycle of a European Capital of Culture project. And then from there, we were thinking, well, how can we keep this going? It's two years. It's a massive project. We put our souls into it. We believe in it. Um, um, we, we want to make it work. We had big plans. We have big plans for uh, you know pro producing a, a platform that offers every solution that anyone from the creative and cultural sector should ever need. Um, Perhaps the way to do that is to connect the projects. So, for example, Cultur Data, which is being led by Matera Hub, who were also partners with Dell, so we've worked closely together and it's been strategical. We had we inserted into the writing of that application that we would be using the platform of Dell to host the development and the outputs of Cultur Data, keeping it animated keeping the audiences, keeping the focus also on European capital of cultures as a specific audience, for example. Um, so that's one way of trying to create the continuity. There have been other ways of doing it as well. Um, uh, for example, the um, uh, capacity building um, for European capital of culture project have um, collaborated with Cultur Data in terms of research that was done initially. Um, we don't need to reinvent the wheel with some things. We can actually make, we, we can do more by building on things that have already been done um, and, and actually go one step further than we would have been able to if we'd done it, we'd done it ourselves. Um, another nice thing about DELS as well, which I just wanted to highlight just to illustrate the potential. Um, this was a project that ran throughout the pandemic, so we didn't meet anybody um, and, and, and lived all of those challenges of screen fatigue and lack of physical contact that we all had. Um, as a consequence, when we came to our final conference, that should have been a massive event in Brussels, that clearly could not happen. We were fed up. And so the team reinvented the idea of doing a radio um, for our final event to spice things up, make it more interesting, uh, keep our attention levels up as well. We didn't want to do a Zoom call. And through that type of experiment, experimentation, we um, not only enjoyed ourselves, but we, we, we had very surprising results in terms of the amount of interest, um, the visibility, the numbers of people following. We reached numbers that we could never have reached had we done things traditionally. Um, and so again, that's another initiative which is actually being it's continuing beyond the lifeline of the DELS project. It's continuing um, to be developed with the experience of Open Design School um, as a pillar project of Matera 2019 and the experience of the other partners and Matera Hub. We have a Radio DELS session next week, for example. <laughs> so, um, you know, these are, these are nice examples of how um, we can um, 
be creative, I think, and and create synergy between the opportunities that are given with relatively short term projects within the European programmes um, and the and the relatively long term life cycle of, of a European capital of culture. Last slide, please, Paolo. Thanks. And so really, it's just um, I just wanted to end with a with a general reflection on that. This is just a snapshot of um, uh, legacy activities, initiatives and projects um, or, or that have come out of European capitals of culture, but also policy driven projects that have come uh, out of a recognition at policy level that that um, uh, the ECOC ecosystem can be supported and, and, and can grow and be strengthened with additional support. Um, there are many other examples. It's about creating, I think, um, a connection, a vision and a strategy to connect the projects so that we can create longevity, um, so that we can ultimately have more impact. And, and certainly, you know, I'm talking, I'm not just talking about digital, I'm clearly talking about strategy, but it's such an inherent part of strategy, the digital visibility, that I think that they, they all merge into one at this stage, um, on this topic at least. Now it's the turn of uh, Paula. Benvinguda, Paula. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, what is the digital rights coalition, the coalition of cities for digital rights? And what you do, what guidance you provide to cities? And how is your work? And this is a difficult question. How is your work or how? your work can be potentially interesting for an European capital of culture. Thank you, Jordi, and thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure. And, and also because it's a different landscape than what I'm used to. I'm used to working with like the innovation teams and like the digital. So it's so it's good to to be with with teams that have a different focus and to also learn how how you're doing it in the field of culture. So I'm really I was really eager to join to see how, how you're doing now. And actually what, what you've been explaining and, and the framework you have and the projects, like the concrete projects that you were sharing, are very much connected to to like our vision um, from the Cities Coalition for Digital Rights. Uh, so I, I'm going to introduce myself, I'm Paula Boet, and I work for the city of Barcelona, uh, especially like um, more concretely for the Commissioner for Digital Innovation. Um, and from there, I, I coordinate the city's um, projects around um, digital rights, in, inclusion, AI, etc. And I also um, am the link between the city and the city's coalition for digital rights. Um, and, and I wanted to bring up the topic of, of digital rights and what we do there, because I think um, it's, it's a pressing issue no? um, when we talk about digitalization in cities and, 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 and in the many areas that digitalization touches. Digitaliz digitalization is, is transforming every aspect of the city um, and from, from like um, cultural um, interactions, social interactions, um, economic, uh, it's, it's, it's producing a super large, large amount of data it's generating new exclusions so it, it, it really puts cities at, at, at this um more at this um it urges them to act um towards this challenge no um cities are due to this concentration of people of, of activities economic cultural social of, of interactions they are hubs of data production no? they um, um, and also um, there are places with, where new technological solutions and new technological applications are tested faster, no? And be it um, digitalized services, for instance, I'm, I'm thinking of culture, but also um, new um, uh, kind of um, devices. So I don't know, um, augmented reality devices or, or I don't know, um, automatic um, vehicles, this kind of stuff, no? So that's, that's really what, what makes it um, important. Um, and also because um, this kind of digital technologies and bring about many, a lot of dangers and risks um, to um, fundamental rights, to democratic guarantees, to, to inclusion, no? This, they, put, they put us at, at this kind of, um, of, of yeah, I, as I was saying, urge to act. No, um, so I wanted to to give like a brief overview of like the catastrophic image, um, and then afterwards uh, explain what cities can do. No, so so this 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 new technologies bring about um, many like they add. We in Barcelona and the cities coalition we, we like to add that they 
that they add a layer of um, inequalities to the inequalities that already exist. And we have seen this with COVID, um, with the digitalization of um, basic services. Um, we see that these kind of technologies close the door to, to basic rights, you know, to, to, um, to work, uh, to education, to have access to administrative procedures, um, to follow up with social life or, or cultural life. You know? And that's why it's more, more important than ever um, to grant access, devices and connectivity. But not only that, um, it also um, digital technologies, for instance, um, algorithmic systems um, bring about uh, new forms of, of bias and, and, and automation of, of inequalities. And that's why they also demand um, the right measures of transparency, accountability, um, explainability to be put into place. No? And they also bring about um, threats to privacy um, and, and, and to... to, to the increased risk of tracking and, and profiling um, communities, for instance, or individuals. No? Um, uh, also, they bring the risk that um, optimization is made easier and, and automation are made easier, but they often come at the cost of, um, of, of leaving people behind, no? of, of automating or optimizing, um, but not for people, maybe for profit or for more efficiency, but not with um, people in mind. And that also links with the idea that some services are, are, are developed, not having the user in mind, but um, doing it for the sake of, of, the, of, the, of the technology. No? Um, so all this, this kind of picture of, of what a, a non-human-centric or non-people-centric um, digitalization could be, um, we have actually been living this um, with the, I like to talk about the smart city um, madness, no? This, 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 um, and I like to say that we're in the hangover phase of that, um, that we're noticing that what happens when you deploy sensors that collect the data? Oh, you might have privacy breaches, you might have um, uh, privacy um, violations, all that, that kind of stuff. And I, I think that we have gone through a decade of, of this um, enthusiasm um, of techno optimism and techno solutionism um, prioritizing digital innovation um, that are super crazy and super um, fancy and advanced but th that don't actually do anything for the city you know and I like to say that we're in this moment of hangover but that we're recovering you know we're we're doing things and and that's where the city's coalition for digital rights come comes in um, this is a network of um, over 50 cities that was founded in 2018 by the cities of Amsterdam Barcelona and New York and with the support of UCLG your cities and UN habitat and and it's a community of cities that are committed to this this vision of, of, of um, digital transformation that is people centered and focused on on leaving no one behind you know um, and we back in in the day when when the coalition was founded we created these five principles that um, reflect all these um, dimensions of, of an ethical and people-centered digitalization. Um, some people think it's only um, about open data or data privacy or about digital inclusion, but it's it's like a overarching topic that that um, um, encompasses a lot of topics. And and I'm I'm gonna. Um, read out loud the principle so you can see more or less how how a digitalization that that is that puts digital rights at the center has to be um taken up no the first principle would be um universal and equal access to the internet um and digital literacy so uh, making sure that everyone has access and can do it with the right um devices and and with um and, and can afford it then having um privacy data protection and security mechanisms to ensure that that technologies are not risky and don't put individuals and their integrity and their um privacy at risk um, transparency, accountability, and non-discrimination of data and content and algorithms, you know, making sure that you're not affected um, un unfairly by an, by an algorithm decision or, or that you know why a decision was made, um, because uh, algorithms have this problem that they, they can be black box, so that's what we call them, that they, uh, based on an input, you get an output, but you don't know what happened in the middle, and that affects you as an individual and affects your fundamental rights, so that's a problem. Um, the fourth principle would be participatory democracy, di diversity and inclusion, and also taking into account that um, digital technologies 
offer new, new new ways and new possibilities for engaging with the citizens and making them participate um how you how you do that and how do you make them have a say over what technologies are, are deployed in the city too that's another important thing and the fifth would be open and ethical digital service standards so what um what what kind of services you build and what kind of um open source um software and 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 inter interoperability standards you put into place to ensure that um digital technologies serve the common good and they they align with this idea of the 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 commons no the and they are not just privatized so with all this kind of um, environment in mind, um, the Cities Coalition works um, to, we say it works in, in three layers. So the first one would be like um, advocacy. So giving this message no, um, at international organizations, other cities, um, talking to city, to city representatives to let them know that this path towards um, uh, human-centric digitalization exists. Um, then we, we have um, the more networking or learning um, and exchanging best practices layer, which is uh, what, what we're doing here. We also do, um, and we, we like to have city managers and the more technical um, personnel in, in city councils um, have exchange you know, and, and, and share how they're doing, um, how they're implementing local projects. And I don't know, I'm, I'm building an open data portal, um, what has worked in your city, what has in, in mine, so these kind of things. And then we have the third layer that um, it's what we're most uh, mostly focused on lately. Um, that would be um, supporting cities and, and, and building capacity, you know, also what we're doing here. Um, which is very important because um, the field of digital rights is very new. Um, there's often like confusion about what are digital rights um, and, and we're really focused on that. So with, with that um, in mind of ultimately um, help, helping cities integrate digital rights in their strategies and projects, um, we have developed um, what, what's called the Digital Rights Governance um, Framework Project, which aims to build um, that the whole framework um, for governing digital rights in cities. No? And this, this project has two components. One is the, the framework, which is a, a document that I will share afterwards that sets um, the foundations um, that a city needs to adhere to when, when committing to digital rights. So, so whether you create a bill of digital rights, whether you um, publish um, you adhere to data principles, what kind of things you can you can um, commit to more at the political level. And then you have the structures, which are um, a kind of mechanisms that you can put in place at a citywide level um, to ensure um, that digital rights are protected. So um, whether it's, uh, it's giving the mandate for digital rights to uh, a political representative, appointing an external advisory council. So these kind of mechanisms that can help and then we 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 developed also some tools that are practical and maybe this is useful for some of you here um that for instance in barcelona we have the, the cv in platform which is a, a digital platform for citizen engagement and 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 or i don't know um yeah open data portals um digital inclusion um surveys and policies so this kind of concrete tools that um break down the whole um a spectrum of digital rights no and that's an exercise that we have done um uh, in collaboration and co-creation with um city experts and also um experts from 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 outside the the cities that have worked in in digital policy and, and this kind of field and and that's that's out there you can watch it uh, you can you can read it um it's it's a draft version that still is going to be iterated but the idea is that um since um digitalization is an open field and an, a very fast evolving one and we're gonna keep that um updated no throughout the the years and that framework which is uh, a document but that it's it's a living one no? and that has very like um useful insights um it's gonna be implemented in, in cities through what we call digital rights help desk which is going to be an online platform um for city city personnel to access there and to have access to 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 experts um that are gonna um guide them no, through this kind of um through this kind of um implementation of digital rights and we're actually gonna like this is very exciting because we're we're gonna start working with four pilot cities in europe so brussels dublin tirana and sofia 
um, that are going to start testing this. And, and I mean, that, that's going to start. I cannot share any, any, any learnings now, but um, they want to, we ask them to, to, to um, define some challenges that they encounter um, when, when, when um, facing digitalization. So for instance, Dublin wants to work on a capacity building program um, on emerging technologies for teenagers, for instance, which is very interesting. Um, or Sophia wants to develop their internal um, digital strategy and add um, digital rights. So that well, we're going to be working with the cities, and and all in all, that's that's kind of a little bit of the, the picture. Um, uh, I don't know if you have questions. Um, it would be great to to get your inputs too. How you think um, digital rights and culture interact? Um, because that's that's like a new field for me. I work for like the more um, digital innovation policy topics. So so it's it's good to see. Um, and and yeah, happy to to be here and to discuss. Thank very you. good. Thank you very much, Paula. Yes, I, I wanted you to mention this this uh, piloting process. You are now involved with. Uh, you said Dublin, Sofia, Tirana, Brussels. and Brussels. The fourth one is which one? Tirana. Tirana. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good, and I'm sure that there will be promising. Uh, spheres in which the agenda uh, and the challenges of uh, digital rights um, coincide with the challenges of cultural rights and, 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 and cultural policies. All right, so uh, now, Nicole, the floor is yours. If you want to, to comment, uh, what you have uh, learned from Anne, Paolo, Becky, and, and, and Paola, and give uh, also perhaps uh, final, final recommendations for, for us all. Um, I'd like to say thank you all for the contributions. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, it's really amazing um, to see the project which Paolo introduced. Um, Becky, wonderful for your insights as well. And it's great to hear um, what the progress has been in the past months. And Paola, um, a really uh, fascinating take. And I think it's so important that we learn from other sectors. Um, maybe my last reflection on um, will be on on a few things. Um, the digital hangover, I think, comes uh, that you mentioned, Paula, comes back to something which was discussed earlier, I think, in this, you know, you have to go through this process of learning. Um, but, you know, the ways of shortening and learning from others so that that, you know, the mistakes that you make, you can make fewer mistakes in your process, I think, are important. So this sharing opportunity is really fantastic. Um, and hopefully, I think it's really key um, in the cultural sector. I think we've finally begun to understand that culture is not neutral and that there are so many value judgments and that the, you know, everything um, we're collecting, everything we do, the people are excluded or who is included. Um, there are a lot of things we need to be aware of and in the digital realm also. So I think this, um, our, our literacy around digital rights is becoming um, stronger in the cultural sector and we saw this reflected in some of the content in our academy camp about these collaborative open source uh, platforms which were encouraged to use for community building noting the challenges as we discussed of knowing how to use these learning those skills and uh, reaching people um, on the platforms that, that they are already on um i don't think I will add any more than that. Um, I loved also Becky's um, perspective on that it's around the, and also also echoed I think by Paula, the, that digital is the service of the bigger goal, not that digital is the, the purpose itself. And um, from that, yeah, it's perfect and keeping people at the center. So that's everything for me. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, Christina Sylvain, uh, also Lucia, uh, from AE Idel, do you want to uh, ask a question or do you want to make any comment? I, I just would like to, to thank you for organizing it. It's been a very intense two days 
but very, very relevant for what we all do. And for me personally, I've learned a lot. And particularly this afternoon session leaves me with a lot of food for thought. It was great to hear past and future experiences, how they will relate with uh, these uh, tools, with this idea of using digital and digital tools. You might have understood that for me, it is somehow problematic because I'm still trying to really understand how to convey the, the right message when I work with institutions about the use of digital and digital tools. So it was very interesting to see how it's been used with what kind of results and what are the very promising future actually applications of this. So I just would like to, to thank you. Thank you very much for these very interesting two days. Thank you, Christina. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would like to also thank you all for firstly organizing this uh, last academic camp and for all the participants and all the experts that uh, took part in these two very intense days. I'm really sorry, I wasn't able to join yesterday for the whole day, but today was uh, very inspiring and uh, very useful. And uh, I think it was a wonderful way how to um, close the journey of Academy Camps. <laughs> and I also would like to invite everybody and especially the, the echo delivery teams uh, that are present here to also look on the other resources that we've been developing uh, during this service contract, like the pool of experts, uh, which uh, now has more than 250 um, profiles in various uh, expertise and also on podcasts, uh, webinars and our library on the website. Thank you. Sylvain. Yes, of course. Uh, of course, I would like also to, to thank you, to thank uh, the consortium, all members of the consortium for uh, the excellent work done uh, all along the way from uh, October 2019 uh, to today. It has been a fascinating uh, journey for me uh, yesterday, today as well. Uh, the digital world, which is so unknown to me, uh, seeing also the many opportunities, but the risks and um, the need for, for a digital literacy, which is still very challenging uh, a bit everywhere. So many, many thanks. It was very nice also to see um, indeed uh, the transfer of know-how, knowledge, uh, uh, practices between uh, past, present, future European capitals of culture, candidate cities as well, because that is really uh, in the spirit of the, of the European Union. I mean, we are just trying to promote uh, that, that ex exchanges uh, to also accelerate uh, um, the knowledge curve of uh, our cities, our citizens, uh, our uh, stakeholders across uh, the European Union. So many, many thanks. It's, it's been a pleasure, really. Um, it, was, uh, it was a challenge. Uh, and and, and uh, when we first discussed uh, this idea with Jordi, we were aware that it was a challenge. Um, but my feeling is, as I've said earlier, is that it um, closes in a very nice way uh, the uh, cycle of academy camps and, and has enabled for a further exchange uh, on the issues that um, are priority issues for, for all of us. Uh, and, and as has been said, learning opportunities are always a luxury. So uh, it's been a wonderful two days. Um, we have here hey, EIDL, who is the lead partner of our consortium. So if Lucia allows me, uh, in the name of the consortium, uh, AEIDL, but of course also Culture Action Europe, but of course, of course also NCAT, uh, the European Network of Cultural Management and, and, and Policy, also in the name of us, InterArts, uh, partners in, in, in this project, and of our associate, uh, Committee on Culture, UCLG. Um, the project arrives to its end, but as has been said, we are leaving also our little small legacy huh? in, in, in many forms, the database of experts, but the uh, repository of information, uh, but also all the material that has been produced uh, for the Academy Camps and also the series of podcasts, which will remain. Huh? So I think that, um, 
beyond uh, the academy camps, there is also a wealth of knowledge uh, to be pulled from uh, for, by whomever is interested in these, in these topics. Of course, uh, Silva, our thanks to you, uh, European Commission, DGEAC, uh, Directorate of Culture, uh, and in particular you and, and, and the team for having, uh, well, put your trust in us uh, during these two years and uh, for accompanying us uh, yesterday and today. Uh, we've been really extremely happy to have you on board. And I think that this has given you an idea of, you know, the, the style also of this project and what we have tried to do over these uh, two and a half, uh, well, 30 months actually. Uh, um, I cannot but not thank all the lead trainers uh, that have uh, worked with us uh, in the design structure and delivery of the Academy Camps. Cristina Navilano uh, and the four other trainers that were with her in our first fully digital adventure uh, back in October 2020. But of course, also Nicole, uh, Nicole McNally. Uh, it was uh, wonderful working with you in the delivery of the second Academy Camp. And then, of course, uh, uh, Silvia Mann, who was yesterday with us, and Francois Matarazzo, who was with us this morning. It's, it's been a luxury working with the four of you and all the groups of people that you have managed to put together. When one looks uh, at the uh, uh, programs of the Academy Camps, there is a wealth there. Of, of expertise, and someone said it earlier, uh, let's not forget about the human touch and the importance of the human relations. And the academy camps were not only about delivering knowledge, but they were also about exchanging and about uh, trying as much as possible to nurture uh, the uh, human relationships that uh, you know, uh, make us work in a, in, a better, in a better way. And of course, as far as I am concerned, uh, uh, Jordi, a big, big thank you to you for managing uh, in such an excellent way these four sessions. And also, of course, to uh, Sarah Vieux from uh, Comedian Cultures, UCLG. So it's been wonderful uh, delivering this last Academy Camp with you. Uh, it's, uh, again, a luxury. And finally, I would like to thank Fran Gracia, uh, my colleague from InterArts, who has accompanied me throughout these 30 months, doing a lot, a lot of the work. So I will always be thankful to him. He's not with us today. He is uh, starting a new professional adventure in Tunisia, but uh, he would have wanted to be with us today. It's, it has not been yesterday and today, it has not been possible. But my gratitude goes to him and, of course, also to Gara Serio, who has been behind the scene these two days silently helping us out. And, uh, well, of course, to all of you who have been with us these two days, I hope that you share in what we all have said that it's been an interesting conversation and let's keep it up and hope to meet somewhere soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.